In this lecture, we're going to have a look at a number of architectural design principles. And we can use these, hopefully, to help guide the process of actually creating the architecture that our game will sit on top of. When we think about architecture, in essence, what we're talking about here is how we will bring together all of the different building blocks, the things that we need to make a game possible. So this would include, for example, getting user input, loading in assets, displaying things in the screen, having a, a series of update and render ticks, all the different bits that we need to bring together into a coherent whole that enables us then to build our game on top of it. That we're referring to as our, our overall game architecture. Ideally, we want to do this in a way that makes it easy for us to bring together the types of functionality that we, we want to have within our game, that makes it easy for us to be able to extend and enhance and enrich our game. And we'll look at, at a few principles um, behind this. So we are creating an object-oriented um, game. You can see over here that we ideally want our design to result in something that is intuitive. Now, by intuitive, what we mean is that uh, somebody using our architecture, it, it makes sense to them that if they're wondering, well, how would this work or where am I likely to find that type of class or that type of method, that their, their gut feel, their intuition as to where it should, should be, where it ought to be in terms of the different classes would normally be true. We want it to be flexible and to be extensible, that as we add in new features within our game, that we can easily integrate these into the overall architecture that we've built. And we also want it to be maintainable, that whenever we have bugs, and we will have bugs, it's, it's a, a reality of software, that we can easily isolate where they're likely to be and then be able to define and to correct those bugs without too much uh, hassle or effort. There's no one way of doing this here. I mean, a, a design in many respects is, is subjective. But there's a few guidelines, a few simple principles which are very useful to to steer you towards designs that are likely to be flexible, extensible, to be intuitive, to be maintainable. And these are good things always to keep in the back of your mind that for your design, every once in a while, sort of ask yourself, well, am I doing it in this way? Or how does it stack up from that particular perspective? So we're going to explore two categories. So the notion, first of all, of cohesion and coupling. Uh, so in terms of, of how we, we link or how coherent a class is. And then we'll go through the, um, the five solid design principles and we'll have a look at what they are suggesting in terms of the structure of our classes. So start off first of all with the notion of cohesion and coupling. And we'll do coupling first of all. So coupling is the degree to which a class or a component, a collection of classes for example, is tied directly to others. So, so what this means is that, let's say for example, I had a fantastic animation system within my game and I wanted to take that fantastic animation system and use it somewhere else. So I go off and I take the animation class or classes and I say, right, let me import it into the new project. If I then find out that, oh, the animation system, it, it assumes it is, is linked in, for example, to the asset manager. That's a notion then of having these two things coupled together, that the animation classes depend upon the asset manager, so they are coupled together. So I'll then have to go back to the original design and to tech in the asset manager classes as well. And where it becomes potentially problematic is that if I do that and I find my asset manager, oh, it assumes you've got access to this or you're linked into that as well. So the the slippery slope here is where one class is linked to another, is linked to another, is linked to another. And if you try to take one part, you can very quickly uh, end up taking most of the system with you. You don't want that. That, that massively reduces the, the uh, extensibility, um, the, the maintainability of the, the structure that we have. So ideally, we want to have something that has um, low or, or, or light coupling between it and interfaces are the most easy way of doing that. But we don't directly link two things together. We say that we um, this, this particular class or component assumes that it will need a certain type of service and that service is accessible through a defined interface. So by doing that, we can lift it out, we can put it into the other system and as long as we can find something that implements that interface, we can link it up to that. And that gives us a better way of making it more maintainable. The other notion then is the notion of cohesion. So cohesion is the extent to which parts of the system are related and work well together. 
Um, so in essence, it's, it is talking about the, how, how cohesive, how well defined the component is that if we are thinking about a certain function within the game, let's say again, we're thinking about the notion of, of animating something, that we will have a class or a small number of classes that encapsulate all elements of that, that are tied together nicely within those classes. And we don't find a, a bit over here and a bit in this other class and a bit in an unrelated one over there, that it is nicely cohesive. The bits are stuck together that should be stuck together. And you know, coupling and cohesion, there's a fine line then between making sure that the things that ought to be stuck together are indeed stuck together, but equally for the things that, that don't have to be, that we do put in a nice interface so we can have them lightly coupled. Next area beyond that then is the solid design principles. And there's five of them, and as you might expect, there's going to be an S, an O, an L, an I, and a D. So start off with the S one first of all. It is the single responsibility principle. And it says that one class or one class should have one and only one responsibility normally. So a class should be written, changed and maintained with a single purpose in mind. Uh, single responsibility improves the maintainability and extensibility of software. So what we mean here, and you sort of see in the, the diagram in this, if I want to have a class that does a certain function, well, that's what the class should do. It shouldn't also then do something else and something else in addition to that and something else in addition to that. So you're talking about single areas of responsibility defined within a class. That will make it cleaner. It's going to make it more easily maintainable, uh, more easily extended, more easily ported, things like that. that there is, there is a, there can be a, a, a line around the granularity of it and things that sort of do fit together in terms of being cohesive. But as a general rule, we should only be linking functionality within the class where it makes sense, where it is consistent to do that. The O then stands for the open closed principle. Uh, so software components should be open for extension, but closed for modification. Otherwise stated, a class should be designed so that changes in behavior or control can be introduced by extending the class, uh, overriding methods, and we want to really avoid having to modify the class directly. So what this is getting at is that if I develop a class, it is reasonable for a lot of classes to expect then that there could be other people, maybe even myself, that will come along at a later point and say, right, I want to change that class. I want to extend it. I want to build upon it. I want to get to something different. And the best, normally the best way of doing that is that we do it through extending the class through an inheritance hierarchy and then overloading the methods that we want to change. Uh, generally speaking, a bad way of doing it is where we actually have to go into the class and start changing the code that's within the class, um, because then we can maybe break that class for anybody else that uses it in a certain way or to a certain effect. The L, then, the L in solid then stands for Liskov substitution principle. Um, this is an interesting one to get your head around that derived types must be completely substitutable for their base types. So a class extender from a base class should be able to be used anywhere the base class is used without failure. Um, what does that mean? It's a little bit abstract. Maybe the, the example of the two ducks here uh, can shed a bit of light on it. So if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, but needs batteries, you probably have the wrong abstraction. So this is getting into the notion that if I have a base class that does a certain pieces of, of functionality and I have a derived class that extends that, I need to make sure that the derive class does everything that the base class did. And wherever the base class could normally be used in, in some function or some purpose, that my derive class can substitute it, that it can fit in there, it can still function, it's not going to break things. Uh, so the example here is that if we said we had our base type was a duck, ordinary feathery duck, it would be wrong to say that a plastic duck is a type of feathery duck. Uh, in as far as there's some things that the feathery duck can do in terms of eating or whatever that our, our plastic duck is not going to be able to do. The I then is the interface segregation principle. It says that clients should not be forced to implement unnecessary methods which they will not use. Uh, and the idea here is, I mean, interfaces are good. They're a way of abstracting out and, and defining interfaces between classes or components. That's a good thing. We want to use interfaces. But ideally, I should avoid 
creating an interface that, for example, defines 15 different methods. And most people that are using it will go, well, I just really want this and this. I don't care about the other 13. Now, it depends. If the other 13 make coherent sense and actually are needed to go along with that one, then yes, you do have to implement them. But if they're not needed, then you don't want to put the user in a situation where if they want to use your interface, you're forcing them to implement a lot of things which don't really make sense or of interest to the user. So there you'll be splitting that big interface into a number of smaller interfaces uh, and letting the user have a, some degree of control over the elements that they want to extend um, or, or to link up with. The final one uh, is the dependency inversion principle. Grand stuff. So depend on abstractions, not on concretions. So what does this mean? So it says there are design modules that are separated from each other and used and, and use an abstract layer to bind them together. High-level modules should not depend tightly, uh, in terms of tight coupling, on low-level modules, but should depend on abstractions. So the, the example here you can see in the picture is that if I have, for example, a high-level class, a light, it's going to depend upon some low-level functionality, for example, a source of power to power that light. And I suppose a software equivalent here is I might uh, write a class that depends upon having a network stream, a stream of data uh, being fed into it. Now, a good design is one where I decouple these two things. That I, I want to avoid a situation where um, my high-level class, the one that processes the data, is tied in, is directly and tightly coupled to the particular network stream that it gets its data from. That's the equivalent to saying if we have a lamp, we're going to solder it directly into the wiring. It means then that we can't unplug it, take it away and plug it into some other source of data or some other source of electricity. Um, so we, yeah, high level classes will depend on low level items of functionality, but we want to make sure that we do that through abstract layers because that will give us more flexibility in terms of how we can reuse that high level class. And that's the takeaways. There's, um, I suppose, the two grouping, seven of them in, in, in total. They're Simple things in the most, but they are useful always to keep in mind um, to, to help you d design your, your code. So, I mean, good design is underpinned by a small number, there's some ones beyond this, but a small number of, of common sense, sensible design decisions. Um, in practice, though, it, it often isn't as straightforward, so design is, is quite iterative. Uh, all of these principles somewhat apply at the same time, and Often it is a, main, a means of finding a balance between different competing principles. Um, so they don't always pull in the same direction. So that does come down to looking at, at what does what and what is the right appropriate balance for whatever it is we are designing. But what is the fight out is that if you do try to use these principles, you'll end up with a, a better design than if you simply ignored them. <laughs>